so now as far as strategies for study what we recommend is that you start with your weakest areas now everybody out there is saying well how do I know what my weak areas are and it's a very simple answer what do you hate okay the subject that you hate the most is the one you are weakest in, okay? And so what you need to do is every single day, as if it were punishing yourself, you're going to start the first thing on that weak area. Because if you're thinking statistically of how you're going to get more points to your score, if you're starting as I would with a zero in pharmacology and you were able to pull that zero up to a 50%, that's a significant rise in points on your exam. Whereas if I started with what I love, which is immunology and microbiology, I would be probably at the 99th percentile on those subjects. I would certainly hope I would be. And so, if I started there, I've only got one extra point I can get before I've got 100%. So yeah, I could work on getting that one point. But when you think about efficient strategies, starting with the thing you hate the most is going to be the best way to rapidly increase your scores. And as I said, the psychology of the study process is one where you have to keep yourself motivated over a long period of time when your body and your mind and your soul are saying to you, please, I can't do this anymore, just shoot me, right? You have to rise above that and remember that everyone has been through this process just as you are going through it, and you have to approach it as if it is a marathon, okay? This is not a sprint. This is not something that I'm going to do by running up and down the stairs twice as rapidly as I can. This is climbing a mountain over months slash years to get to where you need to be. Now, beyond that, one of the things that I think is really useful for studying is to begin to practice thinking about how questions are formulated. Because if you can learn to think the way the person who is creating this exam is doing so, then you begin to see that there are lots of things in medicine that just don't make for very good questions because they would be so much up for discussion, okay? If there are 50 different modalities of treating a patient for a given disease, then differentiating between those in a normal step one student is not going to be something that they can test on because different physicians in different areas at different times would decide to do different things on a very precise and different means. So what you need to concentrate on is the principles of medicine and making certain that you can explain the whole way back down to the molecular level exactly what's going on in the patient that would cause them to look the way they do. Beyond that, always try to start with the patient. Think about their chief complaint. Think about what organ system is the problem organ system. And from there, what tissue within that organ, what cell within that tissue, what protein within that cell, always taking your understanding as deeply as you can in what we understand about that particular disease. Now, this forces students, and I've been teaching Indian students for a long, long time, if you're interested in hearing my feelings about Indian education, it is that you all have an extraordinarily good basis on which to do well on this exam. You have been well trained, you have been well educated, you have been well tested, but what has not happened is that you've not been asked to truly think about and use the material that you've been taught. 
Now that is really no different than US medical schools either. So you should not feel that you are approaching this exam from any different viewpoint than most US medical students, although you and I both know it may be true. I'm sorry, that was Chester, in case you haven't met my cat. Um, it's certainly true that many of you are going to take this exam in a language that is not your first language. So you have my intense appreciation because the average US medical student could no more take, take this exam in a foreign language than they could fly. So you guys already are doing something that's extremely admirable and much more difficult than what they are doing, okay? But we don't in medical school, in my experience, teach our students to think and to think about the management of the problem for the patient. So this is something that you have to add on as you study. Now, when I talk about hypertexting, I'm gonna show you an example of this, and this is something that's going to be in my field, which I told you already is micro and immunology. So I will show you an example of that, and then I will expect you all to be able to go out and use that same sort of standard process for all of the subjects that you study. Because using this sort of template for thinking about a disease is a very useful way of reviewing. That is true to a point, um, I would say, Shirag, to this student. And the point is this. Remember that as you've been studying your way through medical school, you have been seeing different points of view on a subject. Because as you have been studying subject by subject, case by case, you have probably had a variety of different approaches to a particular topic. What I'm saying to you now is that as you change your focus to getting your best possible score on the USMLE, you don't have time to go back and review every single one of those sources that you used during medical school. So what I'm saying to you that I'd like you to do is to think about which of those sources gave a very nice um, a feeling of a topic to you as you were going through, and then have faith that the other perspectives that you learned during medical school are still there in your head. What you want to do now is have a broad review of the principles. And so there should be one book per topic that was the one that spoke to you most dramatically. So I agree with you that having multiple topics, of course, is enriching. But what we're talking about now is the specific focus on this exam and I find often that students who are going back and rereading, you know, multiple texts at a very deep level come to the place on exam questions where they can't make the decision between things because they're focusing mentally on the minutia of a topic rather than the broad picture of what a physician should do in a stepwise fashion if they're evaluating a person with liver failure or with kidney failure or whatever the process is, okay? So I'm trying to wean you away from the detail and focus you into thinking about the principles of medicine, which are the things that are gonna get you the points on this particular exam, okay? I would argue that you guys in India are going to be an advantage on the clinical level of knowledge on this exam. Keep in mind that in the United States, the system is such that a student in medical school cannot even touch or speak to a patient until they have passed the step one exam. So realize that in India, where medical education is deeply hands-on from almost the first moment of medical school, you're going to have a lot more concept 
of what a patient would look like who had a particular disease. And so it's going to be easier for you to make that transition into thinking with starting from the patient. Are they going to have a cough? Are they going to have a fever? What are they going to be complaining about when they come into the office? Versus the US medical student who at the time that they take this exam will not have even been in an exam room in most cases with a patient. Now, if you're wondering how on earth a student can pass this exam from the United States when they haven't even seen a patient, it is difficult for them and they truly have to have some way of having someone sort of guide them through the process of moving from the textbook description of a disease into actually seeing it in your mind's eye and knowing what to do about it. But I think Indian students with the level of clinical experience you will have from the very beginning are not going to be as frightened by the level of clinical uh, knowledge that they will expect you to have. And if you were here with me on Wednesday when I talked earlier um, with a group like yours, I said to them, and I'll say to you now, the step one exam is merging into the step two exam, and step two is merging into step one. Now, our mantra at the Medical School Companion is that um, clinical medicine is built on a foundation of basic science. And so it makes sense to me intellectually that the best physicians in the world will be those who understand the molecular details of a disease, as well as very quickly recognizing the signs in the patient. Um, but this is something that we do in our classroom all the time, is to try to keep you anchored in what the patient is going to come in complaining of, and then what are your stepwise processes to explain what is going on in them. Okay, but let's first of all get done with the idea of how do I organize my study time, okay? You want to make certain that you always take every single topic, start with what the patient is telling you, and work the whole way back to the molecular details of what's causing the problem. And I like this rather simple line diagram, which happens to be a diagram upon which the very famous medical school, Johns Hopkins in Baltimore, redesigned their medical school curriculum about 10 years ago. And when you look at this diagram, starting with the patient who is in the office with a chief complaint, and you work in a very stepwise fashion without any breaks in the process, the whole way down, if possible, to the level of the DNA defect causing the problem, then you know that with that study technique, you're going to have gone through mentally absolutely everything that they could ask a question on. It's gonna to have to be somewhere in this spectrum. And so as you think about the process, this causes you to focus on the patient themselves. This is what I mean by being patient-centered. And you think about what the patient is going to tell you about the way they're feeling. That's always the start. If you think about this historically, it's also the history of the study of medicine. Because down at the bottom here, if you notice, William Osler is considered to be the father of modern medicine, of clinical practice, because he did two very important things. This quote to his students was, listen to your patient. They are telling you the diagnosis, which is a very weighty commentary if you are good at listening and thinking about what that perception of the patient means to what must be going on in their body. So he also was the originator of the medical residency process 
that we use in the United States and most places worldwide, which allows students after their first years of basic science study to go into an apprenticeship, as it were, with physicians who have been practicing in the field for some period of time. So he is a tremendous force in the history of medicine and one that you will learn to appreciate over time. Well, he was the chairperson of the Department of Medicine at Oxford back before the turn of the century before this one. And he was followed in that position by Archibald Garrod, who's considered to be the father of the hereditary basis of disease. And he was the physician who described the first inborn error of metabolism, alcoptinuria. And if you can imagine, he traced the problem back to the DNA level of what was causing that enzymatic defect. So thinking about those two giants of the field, here is Osler over on this end, speaking to his patients about the patient. And here is Garad down at the DNA level saying, well, everything can be traced back to a defect in the DNA. And when you think about those two people following one another historically in medicine as chairpersons of this very famous Department of Medicine at Oxford, you realize the tug of war that has been happening over historical time between the clinical viewpoint of a patient and the genetic and developmental and DNA viewpoint of that same patient. But it, in a nutshell, speaks to all of medicine. Every patient has a problem that they're telling you about that may be affected by their culture or the group of religions that they belong to or a variety of other things which impinge upon the multi-system organism as a whole, that in turn can be traced to an organ that is the most likely source of the issue, to a tissue within that organ, to a cell within that tissue, and to a protein that is a problem within that cell. Now, we certainly don't know the genetic basis of every single disease on the planet, but as far as you can go in this continuum of working from DNA to patient and patient to DNA, I can virtually guarantee you that if this is your organizational plan for each disease, you will be able to answer absolutely every question of principle that they will ask you because it's got to be somewhere in this continuum of what the problem in this particular patient is. So just as an example, let's say, let me start at the DNA level and say to you that I have a single nucleotide polymorphism that is affecting a gene on chromosome 11, and that single nucleotide polymorphism changes a single amino acid in a protein that's known as beta globin. Okay, some of you I'm sure are probably frantically already typing into Chirag that you know where I'm going with this. But remember, when I change that single amino acid in that protein, it causes that molecule to have a tendency to polymerize as it aggregates inside the cell, which of course is going to be my red blood cell. And that polymerized molecule inside that cell is going to be a problem in tissues that are vascular tissues where I've got slower blood flow than normal. So as the blood flow slows, that causes the polymerase, polymerization of that abnormal protein, and that causes damage to the red blood cells because they end up sticking to the endothelium in those sinusoidal organs, 
So the organs that are involved in this process are going to be my spleen and my bone marrow, okay? Liver is also a sinusoidal organ, but remember it has a second vascular flow, so I don't see the damage to the liver that I see in the spleen and the bone marrow. But what this causes is ischemic infarcts in that organ where the blood slows with this abnormal protein inside the red blood cells. And as a result of that, I get ischemic ne necrosis And ischemia is a painful process. So when you ask yourself how this patient is eventually going to present, it's going to be acute episodes of extreme pain. Okay. When you think about how that's going to be described in the words of the patient, they're not likely to come into your office and say, doctor, my, my spleen hurts. Okay, if you think about why that is, it's because there's not a lot of innervation in the spleen. But boy, there is tremendous innervation in the bone. And so extreme bone pain in these individuals as those infarcts occur, which take me to the final picture of the patient. In the United States, remember, this is typically, typically going to be a fairly young, African-American child. And why did I say African-American? Well, remember that sickle cell anemia, which is what I'm describing here, the sickle cell heterozygote has a selective advantage against falciparum malaria. So it was a survivability trait that caused this deleterious gene to be preserved in the population as a whole. So if you notice, what I've done here is just with a single example, I've started on one end and gone to the other. I also need to be able to start with the patient and go backwards, okay? Most of the exam questions you'll see will start with Osler and go to Garad, okay? But if you keep this, as your sort of north star to focus your studies on each of these without skipping any steps, then you will be able to answer the questions that you need to answer for this exam. Realize that what you've really been taught to do before is a much more patellar reflex issue. You've been taught to recognize that patient with sickle cell heterozygosity and immediately to say what the single nucleotide polymorphism is and what the protein is. So you have been taught to jump memorizationally from side to side of this diagram. And what I want you to do is be extremely painstaking about making certain you know what is going on at each of the steps of this diagram, because that will be the question where the questions come from. They're not gonna ask you to regurgitate what the change of amino acids is. They're gonna ask you, why does that change the shape of the protein? Why does that change the function of the cell? What difference does that cell make in the functioning of the tissue, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, okay?